In some of the valuable archive photos and footage about Vietnam's two resistance wars, people will see the image of the Western journalist talking to President Ho Chi Minh or General Vong Nguyen Giap or walking with the Vietnamese guerrillas in the fortified hamlets or underground tunnels. Welcome, Wilfred Burchett. He wrote many articles about the wars in Vietnam, telling the world the true image of the wars. He raised his voices against the foreign invaders and in support of the justice cause of the Vietnamese people. For his stance beside the Vietnamese people, he had been denied by the then Australian government, and for many years, he and his family had to move around in several countries for a living. He is Wilfred Burchett, a world-acclaimed journalist whose writings are still capturing the audience's attention until today. Hello there and welcome to this edition of Talk Vietnam. Wilfred Burchett is a world-acclaimed journalist and a wholehearted friend of the Vietnamese people. Now, although he passed away in 1983 at the age of 72, his legendary support to the Vietnamese people and also to Vietnam still lingers and lives on. And also his works, articles, and dozens of books still much receives the interest of many people in today's society. Now today we're lucky enough to have with us in our studio his son George Burchett with us for him to share with us the memories, thoughts, and also the person of his father. So please join me in welcoming George Burchett. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure and a great honor. Wonderful. Um, I heard that you're coming, you're making this trip this time also to mark the 65th anniversary of Vietnam's National Day. So how has the trip been so far? Uh, it's been a, uh, a uh, it feels like a homecoming, but it's also been a, uh, a, uh, a very exciting trip in the sense that I discover a, uh, a uh, Vietnam that is so full of, uh, of dynamism and that seems to be forging ahead uh, very confidently towards a very uh, bright future and you can see it in, uh, in every aspect of life that I've been able to observe in just the past few days. For you, you mentioned this trip as almost like a homecoming because this is you coming back to the place where you were born. You were born here in Hanoi um, in 1955 and after that you uh, stayed here with your family for two years. Is that right? Yep, my, uh, my, my dad and mom lived in, uh, in, uh, in Hanoi for two years, uh, uh, invited by Uncle Ho after the Geneva Conference and uh, that's where I was born and actually I was born on the day when the last French colonial administrators departed, wow. you know, boarded a ship in Haiphong and uh, sailed down to to, uh, to Saigon, so you can say that I was truly a child of independence. <laughs> exactly. I don't suppose you would remember much from those days. Um, it's, I don't remember anything specific, but there is some kind of feel, feeling that stays. And, uh, and I know because uh, my, my parents were so fond of these two years in Vietnam, and they used to tell us about it so much, mm -hmm. about the, the people, the, uh, you know, the leaders, Ho Chi Minh, Van Van Dong, General Chiap, but also the ordinary people that they, uh, they, uh, they were in contact with. So to me, it's, I always have this very warm feeling that right. stayed with me. And uh, when I was, uh, because from Hanoi we moved to, to Moscow, to where Moscow we lived after. for um, eight years. But uh, when, you know, my little friends ask me, where are you from? I always say, I'm Vietnamese, mm -hmm. I'm from Hanoi. Exactly, they, you were they, born uh, here. And then they look at me and say, but you don't look Vietnamese. I say, but I am Vietnamese. <laughs> I was born there. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you're coming back now and you also uh, nurtured a lot of stories, you said, from your parents about the time here, even though you were just two years old. Well, Vietnam dominated a huge slice of my life because of my, uh, my father's work, uh, you know, reporting the... Unfortunately, after reporting the piece, because he wrote a, quite an interesting book uh, called The North of the 17th Parallel, which was about New Vietnam. And then unfortunately, he had to write again about war because, the, uh, because of the American war, because the Americans replaced the, uh, the French as the... the French. Uh, yeah, so, uh, 
So he reported from uh, South Vietnam, from the jungles, and he reported from North Vietnam, mm -hmm. as it was uh, when the Americans started bombing in 65. And he wrote many, many books and wrote uh, countless articles and made films and lectured. And we had people uh, from all over the world coming exactly. to our house to... Uh, you know, all the um, you know, people that were involved in the anti-Vietnam War movement. So uh, Vietnam was to me a war. It was also an international solidarity movement to stop the war. Mm -hmm. So it was both a negative and a positive. And, uh, but before all, it was a heroic struggle of a heroic people led by a legendary, uh, legendary a great and very kind person to me because I had a personal, uh, because of his friendship with my dad, President Ho Chi Minh. So wow. to me, he's, uh, uh, he's, he was my father's greatest hero, political hero, and he's also my great political hero. So talking about your father's work, uh, there's a biographical film on Burchett entitled Public Enemy Number no. 1, and it was produced in 1981 by Academy Awards-nominated filmmaker David Bradbury. Now, this film shows how Burchett was vilified not only by the mainstream press, but also the conservative public in Australia for his coverage of the other side in both the Korean as well as the Vietnam Wars. It also asked the question of how far the freedom of uh, the press can be pushed or extended during the war time. Now, during this visit to Vietnam, his son, George Burchett, has uh, brought this documentary to show to the public here in Vietnam. So in the following, we'll take a look at an extract. His name is Wilfred Burchett. He's an Australian, but he lives in France. A respected international journalist with a lifetime's work behind him, covering wars mostly, 39 to 45, Korea, Vietnam. In Australia, his name is a dirty word. Many think he should stand trial for treason. Some would like to see him hanged. And why? because for most of his working life, spanning the great post-war confrontations of capitalism versus communism, nationalism versus imperialism, Wilfred Burchett chose to report from the other side. For this, he has paid a price. Now in his 70th year, Wilfred Burchett lives in Paris with his wife and three children. He lives in self-imposed exile and hopes that when time has tempered passions and polemics, history and his own country will be kind to him. Wilfred Burchett grew up in a small Australian country town. His father was working class and a Methodist lay preacher. With little more than a primary school education, Wilfred Burchett was 17 when the Great Depression hit Australia. The family business went bankrupt. The bank took away his parents' house, so Burchett hit the road, joining the vast, trudging army of the unemployed. Capitalism no longer seemed to work. It was discredited. And this was to influence a whole generation of men and women, not least of them, Wilfred Burchett. In Indochina, Colonial France found itself bogged down by a motley group of Vietnamese revolutionaries. The French made the mistake of underestimating their adversaries. It will cost them dearly. Ten years later, the United States will make the same mistake and pay an even greater price. Always sympathetic to the underdog and acting with the instincts of a good journalist, Wilfred Burchett, on his way home from Korea, decided to visit Ho Chi Minh's forces. On the way down to Vietnam, listening to the French radio, the military communications were all dealing with a place called Dien Bien Phu. The French had occupied this place well behind the Viet Minh lines, and from there they would fan out and actually uh, capture the Viet Minh headquarters. When I got to the headquarters,
figure coming out of the jungle, unmistakable figure with its wispy beard, and sure enough, it was Ho Chi Minh. The French had reported several times that he was killed, but here he was, coming out of the jungle with a cape across his shoulders and with a bamboo walking stick. He came into the hut, and after the formalities of asking about my health, I asked him, what is this place that Jen Fu, the French, are going on about? And every radio broadcast. And he took his uh, hat, his sun helmet, turned it upside down on the table, on the bamboo table, and put his hand, he said, Jen Bien Phu is a big valley. It's surrounded by mountains. The cream of the French expedition report are there in that valley. We're around in the mountains. They'll never get out. <laughs> So, um, your father was very well known as a journalist to have been one of the first to protest against the war here in Vietnam. Um, so, how did he get into the subject of Vietnam? Well, he was, uh, he was, uh, he reported the uh, peace talks in, uh, to end the Korean War. And uh, when, the, the, when the armistice was finally signed, there was to be a conference in Geneva to, uh, to finalize the agreements. Exactly. And including, at, as a, at the last moment, Indochina was included in the conference as well. So he decided to, uh, to check what's the situation in Indochina, and uh, he ended up in uh, um, President Ho Chi Minh's jungle uh, headquarters just before the, uh, the Battle of Tian Bien Phu. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, he interviewed Ho Chi Minh, who just appeared from the, the as he describes it in the film, uh, this legendary figure that, that no one even, uh, people were not even sure whether he was alive or dead because the French kept reporting that, you know, that he, he didn't actually exist. So he appeared from the jungle. And one of the questions my dad asked him was, what is this place, Tien Bien Phu? And Uncle Ho took off his sun helmet, turned mm -hmm. it upside down and said, well, this is Dien Bien Phu, it's a deep valley. The creme de la creme of the French military is there. Dien Bien Phu, the valley is surrounded by mountains. We are here on the mountains and the French will never get out. And of course, that's what happened. Right. So did he go into Vietnam with a strong support for Vietnam? I think he went to Vietnam with a great curiosity about Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I think he left uh, I, I think his, uh, his, uh, his uh, uh, meeting with uh, Uncle Ho created a great love for Vietnam and for Ho Chi Minh. Right. So you would say that first meeting with Ho Chi Minh kind of formulated his love and his support later yeah, for Vietnam. Yeah, I think there's something called love at first sight. You know, you <laughs> fall in love with, with countries, it happens. I mean, I felt in, back in love with Vietnam when I first came back into that. So I think that that's what happened with... Uh, with my dad, and he's, uh, he always said that his greatest hero is, uh, is uh, Ho Chi Minh. Uncle and Ho. people used to ask him, oh, are you a communist or whatever? He said, no, I'm a Ho Chi Minhist. <laughs> Ho Chi Minhist. Wow, and after that, uh, his love was realized because he stayed here for two years uh, with his family, um, as you said, at the invitation of President Ho Chi Minh. He stayed two years, and also he went on reporting Vietnam till uh, so pretty much till pretty the end much of his. Later. Uh, yeah. um, did he ever tell you? I mean, obviously he told you a lot of stories about the times he spent here in Vietnam. Uh, do you recall some of these stories, other than the historic meeting with uh, President Ho Chi Minh? Well, the thing about my dad is what you could actually read his stories <laughs> because he wrote about Wonderful. it. So, which, uh, and also he used to write absolutely wonderful letters home, mm -hmm. which. Of course, my mum read us, or when we got uh, a bit older, we could read ourselves. 1955 onwards, your father lived in Hanoi to observe the implementation of the Geneva Accords. Here he wrote some of the books and also articles that became very well known later. Um, do you recall some of these works uh, that he wrote um, about the move of U.S. imperialism into Southeast Asia? I recall very well because... Uh, um, because he was the first, well, the first probably almost only journalist to go into the, uh, to, to actually start reporting 
the uh, American war before anyone knew about it because it was a secret war. And I think he wrote a quite an important book called The Fugitive War in 1963. The Fugitive War? Yeah. That's when he just went to the border areas of mm -hmm. Vietnam and Laos and when he witnessed how the, uh, the Americans were escalating. Uh, because, of course, we know that Vietnam was partitioned and it was supposed to be uh, eventually unified. And uh, it was obvious the Americans had absolutely no intention to allow a united Vietnam. So he started reporting and he really opened up the world to that reality that there was actually a war going on because mm -hmm. no one knew about it. Exactly. And then, of course, it escalated and, uh, and then uh, that's when he went to the, to the actual uh, liberated zones for uh, six months and, mm -hmm. uh, and wrote a very important book called uh, The <coughs> Inside Story of the Guerrilla War, which Inside was published Story. in the USA yes. and was absolutely instrumental in, uh, in, uh, in drawing public attention and also lots of Ameri a lot of American politicians that there was a real war happening and, uh, and there was a real people, more importantly, a real people resisting this war. Saigon, 1962. In bloody street riots, the South Vietnamese openly challenged the authority of the corrupt military regime. Under the Geneva Agreement, Free elections were scheduled to unite North and South Vietnam. Fearing a certain communist victory in the South, the Diem dictatorship, now openly propped up by Washington, refused to hold the elections. The long nightmare of American involvement in Vietnam was about to begin. Once again, Australia sent troops to fight with the United States. Once again, Wilfred Birchett found himself reporting a war from the other side. My sympathy was with the Vietnamese people. They'd been fighting for their independence for literally a couple of thousands of years against Chinese and Mongols and Japanese and, and French. So when I heard there was fighting going on again, I wanted to go down and had a, a, have a look at it, see for myself what was going on. And it was natural for me to go to see the uh, National Liberation Front side of thing. Enough people were covering uh, that war from the other side, from the Saigon side. I felt the other side should be known and should be, uh, should be publicized. Because I considered they were the genuine nationalists. They were the ones who were fighting for the country's true independence. It was not an easy thing for myself at the age of 52 to get involved in doing what the guerrillas were doing, forced marches and living on a meager rations. So I had to go through a training exercise to prove that I could march quickly, that my legs and muscles were still good, that I could carry a pack, that I could live on rice and very meager rations in order not to embarrass the people with whom I would be traveling. I was the only outsider who had ever visited them. And this was true also of the war against the French. No outside journalist ever visited the South. So I was a sort of a morale booster for them that somebody from the other side had come down to have a look and see what their struggle was all about and share some of their difficulties and hardships and dangers with them. I wore the black pajamas of the Viet Cong and the conical uh, straw hat in order to fit into the landscape <laughs> as completely as possible. They started off by using bamboo spears, clubs, even stones, some homemade types of guns. They had an odd collection of firearms, some dating back to the early days of the French colonialization. Whenever I went to Hanoi, which was relatively frequent, I virtually always had a, a breakfast with Ho Chi Minh and sometimes a formal interview, but just normally just a long exchange of uh, ideas. <laughs> 
he was always interested in my travels and uh, what I'd been doing. He would always start off by asking about the family, the children. That's where I used to meet him in the early days, especially if it was raining. I was out in the garden. President Ho Chi Minh, or Uncle Ho, is known to the Vietnamese people, was a very simple, modest man. He could have lived in the presidential palace, which used to be the palace of the French Governor General of Indochina. In fact, he chose to live in uh, servants' quarters behind the palace. I asked him once here, I asked, I said, well, can I take some photos of you inside the office? And he was very embarrassed. In fact, uh, I don't have an office. If it's raining, I work on a veranda here. And if it's fine, I'll work out in the garden. And it's true, he didn't have any office. In terms of his accomplishment, and in terms of his human, uh, his, uh, his human characteristic, I've never met a man uh, like Ho Chi Minh. And I suffered a great sense of personal loss when he died. In no November of uh, 1963, your father took a big journalistic uh, experience, a challenge, when he spent six months in southern uh, Vietnam with the Viet Cong guerrillas. Um, and he stayed in their fortified hamlets and even traveled underground tunnels. So did he ever tell you about this experience? Um, do you recall he, some of his stories on yes. this six months? Of course. He, usually he told us funny stories about uh, how he got... Uh, how there was a, uh, a real serious uh, situation where the, uh, you know, the uh, South Vietnamese uh, was really closing up on them, so they had to disappear into the tunnels, and mm -hmm. he got stuck. He got stuck in the tunnels, so they had to push him, whatever. So eventually, uh, uh, once the alert was over, they had to get him unstuck, and then they had to destroy the tunnel because he was, he, because of his bulk, he, uh, he, uh, <clears throat> he, because of his bulk, he destroyed the tunnel, so they had to, to oh. redo it the whole way. There was another funny story that he tells in the film about the scorpion bite. The scorpion bite. Yeah, where mm -hmm. he... Uh, so, a lot of bugs uh, yeah. around where, in the forest, obviously. But, you know, we were kids, so he always tried to make the stories interesting kind of funny and, and, and funny. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, still giving you an idea of what was Of course, well, we know it was war, war and mm -hmm. war is not funny. And right. we know it was a, but we knew it was a just war. So it was. Uh, For your father. And, uh, mm -hmm. and because he was such a strong character, we were not even worried about him because he was such a great hero. And we knew he was very well looked after by the uncles from the jungle. Well, how about his experience, his further experiences with, uh, with President Ho Chi Minh or later um, I heard also with General Vong Minh Zap? They were close friends and uh, as he says, in every time he visited Hanoi, he would have breakfast usually with, uh, with, uh, with President Ho Chi Minh and other leaders and sometimes it would be a you know, formal interview, sometimes it would be just an uh, informal meeting and mm -hmm. uh, he said that Uncle Ho always asked about us, the, the children, and always sends his greetings. So uh, we always felt that we had this, uh, this big friend. uncle yeah. called Uncle Ho. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was a... Uh, a, a, um, at school in Moscow, and uh, the teacher asked, uh, who is the president of uh, Vietnam? And I said, Ba Ho. And the teacher said, oh, no, no, it's Ho Chi Minh. I said, but it's Ba Ho. <laughs> you know? So I failed. Yeah. He was a very close Yeah, so he, he was like a, like a big family. uncle, and then he has other uncles. Wonderful. Um, how about with uh, General Vong Nguyen Zap? Did he ever tell you any stories about uh, his experience uh, meeting with uh, Well, again, General? I would, you know, we would read about it or see it on interview on TV, mm -hmm. but uh, of course we all knew that uh, General Jap was the, uh, the great strategist and the great, uh, the great military mind that mm -hmm. implemented Uncle Ho's overall strategic vision and, uh, for Vietnam. So. Uh, Oh, it, you know, it, it was like a big family to us. Uh, okay. And Vietnam was an extended family. So uh, there's always this very warm feeling. And uh, I still keep this warm feeling. Vietnam to me is a, 
is something that is in the heart mm -hmm. rather than in the mind. I mean, it's in the mind, but it's very strongly in the heart. Strong in the heart. Yeah. You have a connection to it. Very strong connection. Wonderful. Police ask students. The Vietnam War split the Australian community in two. Birchett's reports were largely ignored by the conservative daily press. But his articles and books were read where they had the most impact, amongst the anti-war activists, both in Australia and overseas. Wilfred Birchett was still the only Western journalist consistently covering the war from the communist side. I've come to believe over the years that my duties as a journalist go beyond the my responsibilities to an editor or to a publisher and that my duties as a, uh, a citizen of the world go beyond uh, my responsibilities only to my own country. In other words, I reject the my country right or wrong. With Australian conscripts dying in the jungles of Vietnam, Wilfred Birchett's activities brought enormous resentment. In this climate, his repeated requests for a new Australian passport were rejected. The Australian government went to extraordinary lengths to keep me out of the country. In 1969, for instance, my father was dying. He was 97, almost 97. And uh, I asked to go back then on, uh, well, on uh, compassionate grounds, but it was refused. I think that there are certain fundamental freedoms that a man is entitled to his opinions and to publish his opinions and that a government has no right to deprive a citizen of his birthright. In fact, it was not until the Australian government uh, was changed, that is to say the Labour government of, uh, of Mr Whitlam came to power, and on the very first day after he uh, took over in Canberra, I got a telephone call from the Australian Embassy, the Australian Ambassador, Mr Renouf, Alain Renouf, in Paris to say he was very happy to be able to inform me that uh, He'd been instructed by Canberra that morning to issue me with a passport. And asked when I was coming along to pick it up, I said, this afternoon, thank you very much. Uh, which I did. And uh, I haven't had that problem ever since. Visit this time to Vietnam. Um, I heard that you had brought uh, some, a selection of uh, documents, photos, uh, to bring to the Vietnam Union of Friendship. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about these documents, these photos? Well, they come from the... Uh from my dad's photographic archives, and um, I've just been... Uh, it's uh, quite an extraordinary collection of um, photos that he took uh, that cover the early days in Vietnam, like 54, 55, mm -hmm. that, that were taken when he was writing a book called the North of the 17th Parallel. And then you have the, uh, the photos taken during his many, many, many visits to the uh, liberated zones. And then also photos of him with uh, President Ho Chi Minh prime, and many other leaders, General Jap and uh, exactly. Prime Minister Phan Van Dong, but also ordinary people and some very telling photos about the effects of uh, US uh, bombardments of, the, of North Vietnam. Right. So, so they're quite a... Again, it's his unique ability to be on the spot and to, to, see, the, uh, to see the real picture right. and then to transmit it, to, the, mm -hmm. to show it to the world. Now, in, in this uh, selection of photo, uh, there was a passport, um, a, passport uh, a photo of a passport granted from, uh, to him by the uh, government of Vietnam. Can you uh, explain this passport? Well, in... Uh, in uh, 1955, actually just a month before I was born, he, uh, my dad attending the uh, Bandung conference. Mm -hmm. He flew there with actually with uh, Prime Minister Phan Van Dong. And on the way back, as he was crossing into from China to uh, into Vietnam, his um, his uh, British passport disappeared. And then when he applied to the Australian uh, to the British authorities through the uh, for a new passport, hey. it's a bit complicated. He had a British passport, he was an Australian citizen. Mm -hmm. At the time, they could have... Anyway, to cut the Australian government refused for 17 years to wow. renew his passport. So basically, he was uh, in Vietnam without a, uh, without a, without a passport. passport. And when he tried to uh, register us as Australian citizenship, the government said, no, no, no refused. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the Vietnamese government issued him with this uh, 
big document called a uh, laissez passer mm -hmm. the non lieu de passeport, which means basically it's an identity document that says that this person is who it is, and mm -hmm. please and please let him in. Please, yeah, assist. So, but it was of course only valid for socialist countries. Exactly, and uh, so so the Australian government denied him. Uh, the right to renew his passport mm. during 17 years because of this controversial issue that he was covering on the other side. Indeed, to punish him, well, yeah, to punish him for Korea and for, uh, mm -hmm. for yeah, basically, and, and later, basically, basically running a story that was contrary to the uh, official Cold War propaganda that say that communists are evil and we have to fight it wherever it is. Exactly. And, uh, the domino theory that, uh, that uh, allowed the U.S. and its allies mm -hmm. to escalate the war and to bomb Vietnam and to napalm Vietnam and to right. poison the, uh, you know, with defoliants. Mm -hmm. So uh, governments just don't like to hear, uh, to, to, to have anyone... Related to... In, indeed. The um, communist side. Mm, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Your, your father obviously had a lot of challenges, uh, as we said, with uh, the government's, uh, the Australian government, and it created kind of a discomfort, almost like a negative feeling, um, even from supposedly Australia, which is your country. Um, so how did that affect the family life? Well, of course, because he, didn't, we, he couldn't live in Australia, so we lived in different countries like uh, mm -hmm. Moscow, when it was still USSR. Mm -hmm. Then we moved to Cambodia, to Phnom Penh, because uh, my dad wanted to be closer to the, um, to the action in, mm -hmm. uh, in Vietnam. So we were very lucky to live in this wonderful, peaceful uh, Cambodia before, tragically, it uh, got dragged into the war. Uh, we left just before uh, Prince Yanuk was overthrown and, the, uh, and you know, mm -hmm. uh, Cambodia was dragged into the war and then we had the horror of the right. Khmer Rouge. Uh, then we moved to Paris because uh, the Paris peace talks had started, so uh, my dad wanted to be closer to the peace talk and, of course, Paris mm -hmm. was quite, I mean, I love Paris, I think it's one of the most beautiful cities in the world. But the one thing I was always missing is my own country. So eventually, when uh, when uh, I settled in Australia, it, uh, I said, "Well, and that was after my dad died." But that wasn't easy either because there was still this yeah. huge prejudice that follows me, and there is uh, the, the, there is still this perception, uh, and it's uh, still perpetuated by some sections of the media and the exactly. uh, sort of more right-wing conservative establishment, and uh, that you know they they have to keep this sort of. Uh, trade the Birchett uh, thing uh, because it serves certain purposes. I mean, uh, we have what we call the history wars in Australia that mm -hmm. everyone is trying to claim the... Uh, history is politicized in Australia and uh, Wilfred is obviously one of the uh, sort of uh, punching okay. balls for mm -hmm. different uh, versions of history. But I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very comfortable with what my dad is. I think he's a great hero, but a great hero for humanity, not just for a... Uh, not just for on a sort of nationalistic or uh, uh, you know narrowly defined uh, patriotic. He, he was a true internationalist, and uh, he believed in socialism. He believed in the just cause of the um, Vietnamese people, and he stuck by them. Right, and it's wonderful that he had a family um, such as yourself, your uh, brothers and sister, and my brother, my sister, who my really wonderful supported mother. Him. Yeah, absolutely. We, um, uh, but. Despite we supported him because he was, uh, apart from being a great journalist, he was a uh, very wonderful and very warm human being with a uh, fantastic sense of humor. And uh, f he was just great fun to be around. Mm -hmm, exactly. He made our life brighter and more interesting. Mm -hmm. Three weeks after Hiroshima, Wilfred Burchett landed with the first wave of American troops on Japanese soil. 
His official assignment, along with 250 other correspondents, was to cover the surrender ceremony on the US battleship Missouri. 249 correspondents obeyed that order. One man did not. Wilfred Burchett secretly boarded a civilian train and headed 400 miles inland to Hiroshima. There was no city left, it was just dust. I went to a hospital which had survived in the outskirts of the city. These people were all in various states of physical disintegration. They would all die, but they were giving them whatever comfort could be given until they died. And the doctor explained that he didn't know why they were dying. I didn't know what name to give to this disease, so I called it atomic plague. What I'd seen was the end of World War II, but it would be the fate of cities all over the world in the first hours of a World War III. I felt staggered, really staggered by, by what I'd seen. And just where I sat down, I found some lump of concrete, I remember, that had not been pulverized. I sat on that with my little Hermes typewriter. And my first words, I remember now, were, I write this as a warning to the world. Before Vietnam, he, you mentioned that he was in Hiroshima. He was one of the first Westerners here, there the to first. the first, the the first. Westerner there to uh, become a journalist and uh, to cover the event there right after the atomic bombing. Um, so, can, do you recall some of the stories that he told you as a kid um, well, covering those events? The Hiroshima story I know as a, as a history, but uh, the fact is that he was the first Western reporter to go into Hiroshima, uh, which is quite significant because uh, during World War II he was with the, uh, I mean, he covered it in Burma, India, etc., but he was with the um, American fleet in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And um, when they, you know, when they uh, landed in Tokyo, he landed with the uh, all the journalistic core, and then he heard about this big bomb that uh, happened in Hiroshima, and uh, something in his mind said that this is the uh, the big story. So when all the journalists went to cover the Japanese surrender, he boarded a train on his own uh, and, and uh, went, went to, to Hiroshima. Hiroshima. He didn't know what what it was. He knew exactly. there was a big bomb, but uh, and he was staggered to see what happened. Mm -hmm. this, it, I think it totally changed his uh, perception because what he, he, he wrote this fa very famous article headline I write this as a warning to the world exactly. and he described something called the atomic plague that no one knew what it is what he saw in Hiroshima was what the world would look like if there was a world war three right so after that his obsession was that uh, was to, to, to uh, a warning to any people. any any uh, uh, avoid that stop that and his last book, just before he died, was called Shadows of Hiroshima. It was his mm -hmm. uh, recollections about Hiroshima, and it was his testament to the world. He seemed to be a man who was always on the move, yeah. um, always chasing after some story, mm. even until his, uh, his last days. Well, he was, a, uh, you know, he was a journal that was in his blood, you know, chasing stories. He, he liked it. That was, right. his, uh, that was his life. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that was what he lived for. But... What is interesting is that he's, he was also a journalist with a cause. Mm -hmm. So he didn't just uh, sit, uh, sort of, he wasn't detached. Exactly. He was always accused of being oh, too close to this or to that, but that was his choice. Mm -hmm. He covered stories in which he believed and that he thought were important. Exactly. And that is why it was important for the world to know them, not, not just a newspaper, an editor, or just to make uh, headlines, but to alert the world to certain uh, important issues. So coming to Vietnam this time, George Burchett and his wife had the occasion to visit the Ho Chi Minh Muse Mausoleum and also Museum. Um, he and his wife had the chance to kind of recall their 
father's dearest memories uh, alongside the great leader, President Ho Chi Minh. So we'll get a chance to look at their visit. I can always imagine how my father first met Ho Chi Minh, which was, uh, you know, before, just, just before the Battle of Tien Bien Phu. This very modest man, in, you know, dressed like a peasant, could, uh, could defeat not only the French, but also the Americans. I think it was the man that made the greatest impression on him, so for all his life he was, uh, he was inspired by Ho Chi Minh, and he, you, I could say that he worked very actively for the cause of Vietnam uh, independence and reunification, and uh, it makes me feel very proud to be part of that history as well, even though I didn't actively participate, but I grew up with it, so it, it formed me, uh, my thinking and my, uh, my feelings for Vietnam, for President Ho Chi Minh, and for all the Vietnamese leadership and the Vietnamese people. The greatness sometimes is not very big, but it can be small, but it's very strong and beautiful. So during this visit, how has everything been? How has the reception of the Vietnamese people been uh, towards uh, you and your wife visiting? Well, it's been, uh, it's been to me, it's been uh, quite overwhelming. Uh, uh, so many people came to me and said, Oh, I've read your father. Oh, I've met your father. Oh, I knew your father. I knew your father in... Uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, all sort of places, including the state president, is that right? Including the president who said, "I met your father in uh, South Vietnam in 1964. Wow. I was a student in Saigon, and then I sneaked into the uh, liberated zones, and that's where I met Wilfred Burchard." Mm -hmm. So uh, it's uh, and also what is wonderful is to be in, uh, surrounded by in such a friendly, warm, uh, warm atmosphere. It's uh, it's. It's, it's very, very moving, very, very special. The first trip back um, after uh, you left Vietnam in 1957, mm. when you were two years old, mm. and then you came back. Uh, when was it that you first came back? 2006. 2006. And this is the second trip? This is the second trip, yeah. Wow. How do you perceive Vietnam today? I'm a, I'm a, I perceive it as a, as a... I feel it's, it's young and very dynamic. That's how I perceive it. Um, Overwhelmingly, there is some uh, some uh, some vibe in the air that that you, you I really sense a, a country forging ahead that is, mm -hmm. uh, but proudly because because it's uh, it's won so many uh, amazing victories, historical victories. Uh, of course, independence, then uh, Gen Bien Phu, then uh, a victory over American imperialism, then overcoming the diffi economic difficulties and now seemingly on the right path to a, a very, very br bright future. And I really, really mean it. I, th that's what I feel. Talking about the future, do you think you'll uh, come back to Vietnam and spend more time here where you were born? I'm actually planning to early next year to come back for a few months and, uh, and uh, start a, uh, a uh, art project because I'm an artist. An and, artist, yes. oh, wonderful. And, uh, wow. make, maybe make a film as well and uh, sort of uh, re reconnect with Vietnam and try to discover my Vietnam because uh, until now it was my Vietnam through my father's, Your father's eyes, eyes and his exactly. experience and uh, which was in a way a shared experience because mm -hmm. we lived it too but uh, it, it was away from Vietnam and now I want to feel the, uh, the just explore Vietnam, discover Vietnam and, uh, and, and, and you know, take it to with me, show it to people in Australia and maybe elsewhere. Well, we look forward to uh, welcoming you back to Vietnam, thank you, thank your you. home country. I look country. forward to coming back. And all of these wonderful works that you have in mind, we'll be looking forward to that too. Thank you so much for being in our studio today, sharing your stories of uh, Wilfred Burchett, your father, um, and sharing his thoughts, his memories with us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been a great pleasure. Been a great it has been a great honor to be here in Vietnam and in this studio to, uh, to talk about a man I, uh, I dearly love and truly admire, my, uh, my father Wilfred Burchett. Thank you. Thank well, you. ladies and gentlemen, that was our edition of Talk Vietnam. We had a talk with George Burchett, who is the son of the world-acclaimed journalist, a great friend of Vietnam, Wilfred Burchett. That's it for our edition of Talk Vietnam. We'll talk more next time. Goodbye.